The military exploits of Germanicus reached Rome with startling speed. News of the Rhine mutiny's brutal suppression, followed by his savage campaign across the Rhine, struck the city like a thunderbolt. Germanicus had led his troops to the Marsi's autumn festival, striking in the early morning hours and slaughtering them in their sleep. A campaign not sanctioned by Tiberius or the Senate, and sharply divergent from the restrained policies of Caesar Augustus, who had commanded no further expansion into Germania. In the spring, Germanicus continued his relentless advance, laying waste to the chatty tribes and capturing countless slaves for Rome's markets. The Roman people erupted with joy at the news of his victories, specifically the brutality with which Germanicus avenged the 17th, 18th and 19th legions who had fallen in the Teutoburg. Upon defeating the Chatti, Germanicus recovered the eagle of the 19th legion and managed to capture the pregnant wife of the traitor Arminius to even more acclaim. Next, Germanicus visited the location of the Clades Variana. There he paid his respects to the dead, solemnly burying in a mass grave all the bones, human and animal, with the greatest of honours. As the news circulated through the city, the Roman people cheered for Germanicus as if he were already emperor, easily overlooking the complicated political landscape Tiberius navigated. While Tiberius grappled with the enduring legacy of Augustus, dealt with his mother Julia Augusta's interference, contended with the Senate's scheming, and wrestled with the unpredictable whims of the masses who sought to influence Rome's political machinations through popular acclaim, the people saw in Germanicus only a hero, a Julius Caesar for themselves. Tiberius read the dispatch handed to him by his Praetorian prefect, Lucius Aelius Sejanus. The dispatch, a collection of reports from Sejanus's ever-expanding network of spies, detailed the latest murmurings about Germanicus's relentless campaigns in Germania. Having exhausted Gaul's supply of horses for his legions, Germanicus now directed the construction of a hundred ships along the Lippa River. Instead of navigating Germania's treacherous terrain come spring, he planned to sail his troops along the North Ocean's coastline, through the estuaries, and up to the Ems River. The Germans, however, had attacked the fort where the fleet was being assembled, and desecrated a nearby altar dedicated to Drusus, Tiberius's brother and Germanicus's biological father. Though the Germans had retreated upon the arrival of reinforcements, Germanicus promptly restored the altar in his father's honour, and then hosted grand funerary games for his soldiers, in Drusus's memory. Yet Germanicus's exploits were not the only concern in Sejanus's report. A simmering discontent among certain senatorial families, particularly the Scribonius Libo clan, was beginning to surface. It was always the Libo, the family of Tiberius's former mother-in-law Scribonia. For twenty years the Scribonii Libo had sought to bring down the Claudii Neronis. Their efforts were evident in the premature election of Tiberius's late stepson Gaius Caesar to the consulship while still a child, an election that ultimately drove Tiberius to leave Rome for seven years. And of course, how could the Scribonii Libo not have been involved in the plot to rescue Julia, Scribonia, and posthumous Agrippa from exile, intending to deliver them to the safety of the legions at Portus Julius? Now, Lucius Scribonius Libo, the consul elect for the upcoming year, and his brother, Marcus Scribonius Libo Drusus, both grand nephews of the old and bitter Scribonia, were reported to be visiting astrologers. According to Sejanus's report, Scribonius Libo had asked one astrologer, will I be rich enough to pave the Via Appia with coin all the way to Brundisium? The amount of wealth required to pave the Via Appia with coin from Rome all the way to Brundisium was beyond even that of Tiberius, who as emperor was the richest man in Rome. What were the Scribonius Libo brothers really asking? 
Apart from their family connections to Scribonia, Marcus Scribonius Libo Drusus was also the adopted nephew of Tiberius's mother, Julia Augusta. With Germanicus occupied in Germania, these brothers, cousins to Germanicus's wife, Agrippina, might now see themselves as politically well-placed enough to challenge Tiberius for Rome's curule chair. Then, the Scribonii Libo could once again attempt to rally the people against Tiberius, this time in support of the upcoming consul, Lucius Scribonius Libo. And so, Tiberius issued a warrant to the Senate for the arrest of Lucius and his brother, Marcus. A trial would be held, and the Senate, Rome's oldest political body, would determine their fate. It was Publius Sulpicius Quirinius, a close associate of Tiberius, who became the lead advocate for the defence of the Scribonius Libo brothers, his maternal relatives. Quirinius had shifted his allegiance to Tiberius soon after the death of Gaius Caesar, whom he had served as tutor and adviser in the East. Following Gaius's death, Quirinius was appointed legate of Syria by Caesar Augustus, who had recently incorporated the territories of Judea into Rome's Syrian province. Quirinius was tasked with conducting a census for taxation purposes, a move that provoked strong resistance. In response to the census, a new faction of Judean nationalists known as the Zealots emerged, led by a man named Judas of Galilee. The Zealots fought against the census, even burning the homes of Judeans who complied with the Roman order. Despite this intense opposition, Quirinius succeeded in his mission and later returned to Rome, where he continued his close friendship with Tiberius. But that friendship would not serve him regarding his relatives. Tiberius had to maintain the appearance of impartiality. So when Quirinius appealed for help on behalf of Marcus Scribonius Libo Drusus, who had suddenly fallen ill, Tiberius dissembled, advising him to take the matter to the Senate. However, the Senate had little choice but to try a case brought before them by Tiberius himself. During the trial, Tiberius sought to interrogate the household slaves of Marcus Scribonius. Quirinius, however, objected, citing a long-standing senatorial decree that barred the use of confessions from tortured slaves against their masters. Such testimony was deemed unreliable, as a slave with a grudge could manipulate the situation for personal vengeance. But as emperor, Tiberius wielded significant authority over both legal and administrative matters, including the right to seize the property of those under investigation. Exercising this power, Tiberius confiscated the slaves of the Scribonius Libo brothers and sold them to one of the questors who managed Rome's treasury. No longer under Libo Drusus's ownership, the slaves were subjected to torture. From their coerced confessions, Tiberius extracted the information needed to secure a strong senatorial conviction against both brothers. After the prosecution presented its case, the court adjourned to allow the defendants time to prepare their defence. During this interval, it was not uncommon for defendants, overwhelmed by the charges against them, to choose to end their own lives rather than face the court again. Scribonia Libo, now in her eighties and having outlived her daughter and nearly all her grandchildren, visited her grandnephew Marcus during this interval. With fierce determination, she implored him to continue the fight and passionately urged him not to take his own life. But Marcus saw the inevitable outcome. Gaius and Lucius Caesar, Julia, Julilla, Posthumus Agrippa. The Claudians always won. In resignation, Marcus Scribonius Libo Drusus took his own life, falling on his sword. After being found guilty of conspiracy against Tiberius Caesar, Consul Lucius Scribonius Libo was compelled to commit suicide as well. The estates of the deceased Scribonii were confiscated by the state 
and redistributed among their accusers as a reward for their loyalty. Their statues and funerary masks were removed and banned from use by their descendants. Additionally, a decree was passed forbidding any member of the Scribonius family from using the surname Drusus, a name deeply associated with the imperial family. Following the trial of Lucius and Marcus Scribonius Libo, Tiberius issued a sweeping decree. All astrologers were to be exiled from Rome. No longer would someone be able to consult astrologers with questions that might subtly undermine the Principate. Tiberius himself would be the sole arbiter of such knowledge, with his own personal astrologer, Thrasyllus, being the only astrologer permitted to remain in Rome. To further ensure that no other families could manipulate the Roman people against him, Tiberius abolished the elections for governmental offices and city magistrates. From now on, these positions would be appointed solely by himself, the emperor. With the Senate falling in line and greater legal authority concentrated in his hands, all that remained for Tiberius to control were the legions. Yet, at that moment, their loyalty was sworn to Germanicus.